Hello and welcome to Tech Deals Resolution and Detail Performance Comparison. Today we are testing one game at multiple detail settings and multiple resolutions on the GTX 1080 Ti 11 GB graphics card. The computer that we are testing this in today is the AMD Ryzen 7 1700X running at a fixed 4.0 GHz with 16 GB of DDR4 2933 MHz RAM installed. The video you are watching was recorded using NVIDIA's Shadow Play. There's about a 5% performance loss on average for using the built-in recording software. Because we are testing resolutions other than 1080p today, I have to use Shadow Play because my Elgato HD60 S capture card only works at 1080p. Fraps was used for the benchmark results you'll see at the end of this video, and MSI Afterburner is used for the real-time performance numbers you see in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. This is going to be a bit of a different video. I am including both live gameplay as well as the built-in benchmarks. Why? Because I am doing quite a few tests this time. We are testing 1080p versus 1440p versus 2160p, better known as 4K. High detail versus very high detail versus ultra detail at all three resolutions. However, for practical considerations, doing live gameplay nine different times, three different details at each resolution would be impractical. And frankly, it's not playable at every detail setting at every resolution. So what I'm going to show you here are three live gameplays, one detail setting at each resolution, and then I'm going to show you the built-in benchmark results for all three detail settings at all three resolutions in the same machine on the same card so you can get an idea of the scalability of performance at different resolutions and detail settings on the same hardware platform. I have previously done a video with the previous generation of TI cards, 780 versus 980 versus 1080 Ti. However, that was all done at the same detail setting and the same resolution. The idea in that kind of video is to compare different hardware at the same settings. This video is testing different resolutions and details on the same hardware. So we're basically altering what variables that we're testing. So if you are interested in running a GTX 1080 Ti and you want to know if I put this in a modern Ryzen 7 system, what resolution, what detail can I run at and get how much performance? Side note, this shot here is really epic. I am about to be fired on by a missile, so I am doing an emergency descent, which I, of course, that would destroy the helicopter in real life, but we're ignoring that because that's a video game. So the missile did not come in after all because we landed. And so I'm actually going to use my drone to spot the missile launching platform, call in a mortar barrage, destroy it, and then take off and go complete the mission. I've failed this once or twice before, being hit by that particular surface-to-air missile battery, but hey, oh, not quite close enough. We'll get there. Yeah, I'm physically too far away. It's not going to work. There we go. I only interrupt my performance commentary because I thought this was actually pretty cool because they were locking in on me and I'm flying and I do an emergency descent and boom, it's destroyed. Now I can go get in the helicopter, which I just left on the road. You can actually see it smoking because the hard landing did actually do a little bit of damage to it. And of course, I knocked down the fence and, you know, the fence actually probably wouldn't hurt those rotors. If that's a Black Hawk helicopter, the Black Hawk helicopter rotor blades are so big and heavy and they have to lift so much weight. A chain link fence actually probably would not substantially damage them. Well, it would damage them and I wouldn't want to fly around voluntarily afterwards except perhaps in wartime, but it would still fly. They, they, uh, they're they designed to be able to hit birds and other objects in flight and not come out of the sky. For those of you curious in a helicopter, the real risk of bird strikes is a bird coming into the windshield and hitting you, the pilot, or the other crew, not the rotor blades. Those rotor blades can absolutely withstand a bird strike. I remember years ago flying in a smaller helicopter, a little four-seat helicopter, not a military helicopter, and we were taking off from an airport and a plastic bag, I kid you not, flew across the field and got sucked up into the rotor blade and actually wrapped itself around the tip of the blade. We're sitting there hovering and it was making an awful racket. You could hear it from inside the helicopter, but there was no vibration, there was no, um, uh, there was no effect other than the noise. The pilot shot the helicopter back down, shut the engine off, and that thing was complete. It was a big bag, a, a, a big, huge plastic, uh, kind of a 30-gallon trash bag kind of thing. Not a little grocery bag, but a big trash bag. And it was completely wrapped around the rotor. How it didn't get flung off, I have no idea, but it was noisy. 
and I remember uh, uh, saying, "Is that you know? Does that hurt hurt the helicopter?" And he's like, "No, that's no big deal. It can it can hit a bird. That plastic bag's not going to bother it. We just obviously don't want to go flying around with it on there." Interestingly enough, so I dropped off the helicopter, got my reward, and then immediately jumped back in the helicopter and took it. So it's like, "Hey, thanks for the rewards, guys. Uh, I'll just take the helicopter I just delivered, okay? So I'm going to have the reward and the helicopter." Now we are coming after a convoy. Now this is the worst helicopter to go chasing. The convoy in because your angle of fire out the windows is just absolutely dreadful. So I'm actually going to put the helicopter down here and oh and of course I landed it right next to them and uh, we're going to have well and now I've been knocked unconscious while the convoy drives past but hey that's what my friends are for. They will revive me while they're busy being under fire. But this is exactly the kind of thing that I do when I do live game testing. I really play the game and really experience it. It would be one thing to just show you the built-in benchmark results. It would be a lot easier. There's about an, oh, not quite an hour and a half of total gameplay between the three different resolutions uh, that I tested this on. And certainly editing and voicing this over takes a lot longer than simply throwing up some built-in benchmarks, putting some charts on the screen and say, here, here's a video, here's some information. Now, when you look at the benchmark results at the end of this video, it is worth noting that, um, and thank you teammates. Oh, let's get on a bicycle, let's get out of here. Ooh, that's bad, we're being shot at endlessly, but somehow we escape, bulletproof. So while it would be much easier to make such a video, I think it would have far less value. There's also a benefit into me actually doing the live gameplay, recording it, and then talking about it because it provides much more insight than the benchmark charts do. For example, sometimes a built-in benchmark will show a game as playable. You can see my bike smoking there from all the bullet hits. A game will show up as playable in the benchmark charts, and I totally screwed up again. But don't worry, they'll save me. So the game will show up as playable if all you look at is the minimum, maximum, and average frame rates, or even the 1% minimums in a benchmark chart. The question becomes, is it actually smooth in the real game? Some games built in benchmarks are better than others, but I, <laughs> that fell on its side when it spawned. Yeah, gotta love random instant vehicle spawns. Regardless, my experience has told me that actually playing the game is how you find out whether it's really playable or whether it just appears to be playable on the benchmark. We are now about seven and a half minutes into this video. I'm gonna keep talking over this for a little bit longer because I realized that some people wanna see extended gameplay. They wanna see action scenes. They wanna see what the game really looks and feels like with real-time performance numbers running in the upper left-hand corner. If you are not that person, that is what timestamps in the video description down below are for. You can certainly skip around to each of the runs, 1080p, 1440p, and 4K for the live performance. You can skip ahead to the built-in benchmark, and of course you can skip ahead to the charts and results at the end. However, if you just look at the charts, you're only getting a small piece of the overall information. If all you needed was charts, well A, first of all, you wouldn't need YouTube. You could go to a web page and look at charts. Second of all, this video would be three minutes long and not very interesting, but you would not be nearly as informed as you will be by watching at least a portion of each of these gameplays. I understand not everybody wants to watch the whole thing. I try to make it interesting and fun, point out uh, things that happened, and then sometimes just throw in random commentary because, hey, it's YouTube, why not? It's fun. Uh, some of you have even commented that you do other things and put these videos on in the background, and that's awesome, and I thank you. If you actually sit and watch the whole thing, that's epic as well. Have I told you guys I appreciate all of you who watch my videos? You are epic. Now, this mission that's coming up here, this is actually one of the story missions. We have to go find the refinery chief, and basically we have to intimidate him, and he's going to ignore us, even though we're all heavily armed and have a minigun. How many miniguns are in Bolivia? They must have the, I've said this before, they must have the worldwide supply of miniguns for like a year or five years. Every other vehicle seems to have a minigun. Where are the mod deuces? I mean, miniguns are fine and all, but at the end of the day, if you really want to do some property damage, if it's anything other than a soft target, I'd rather have a mod deuce than an M134. 
For those of you who may be unaware, a Ma Deuce is an M2 50 caliber machine gun. The shell and weight size difference between a 50 cal and the 7.62 millimeter bullets that are fired by a M134 minigun are massive. Even if the caliber size difference doesn't seem like it would be that big a difference because 50 cal is 12.7 millimeters versus the 7.62, but the bullet size, the grain size, the amount of smokeless powder in a, in a 50 cal round is just unbelievably different. So if you want to stop a moving vehicle, for example, if you want to hit an engine block, you want a Modus, not a minigun. The minigun will shred the sheet metal of the vehicle. It will destroy the tires and obviously kill all the occupants in like less than one second. But if you actually want to knock the vehicle out and take whoever's inside it prisoner, you'd be much better off with a Ma Deuce and shoot the engine block. That way you don't shoot into the cabin and hurt the poor people that you're attempting to take prisoner slash hostage slash whatever. In any case, so we talked to the foreman, we hopped into our nice buggy with a minigun on the roof, which seems to have unlimited ammunition, which is handy because anybody who knows anything about miniguns knows that you go through ammunition very quickly. A standard M134 electric minigun has a selectable firing rate between 2,000 rounds a minute and 6,000 rounds a minute. Let's pretend for a minute we're using the lowest speed of 2,000 rounds a minute. 2,000 rounds of 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO ammunition weighs 190 pounds and you can fire it all in one minute. Now a minute might seem like a lot of firing, but in a serious engagement where you need such a weapon, a minute goes really quickly. And the last thing you wanna do is to have your weapon one run dry in the middle of combat. Now, of course, a vehicle such as this could carry multiple boxes, but if you had five 2000 round ammo boxes to give you five minutes of firing, which on an extended in the field deployment, you would definitely want. Now you're looking at about a thousand pounds worth of ammo plus the weight of the gun, the mount, the soldiers, all the other kit that you're carrying, and that buggy that we were driving would definitely be very, very heavy. It certainly wouldn't handle very well, and I wouldn't want to drive it over very bouncy terrain at any decent speed. However, this is a video game and we don't have to care about any of that, so we get unlimited ammunition and great off-road performance because reasons it's fun who cares realism is boring and you can die in real life and in a video game you can't so we'll play the video game and skip the real life version now if we look at our real-time performance numbers in the upper left hand corner of the screen you'll notice something interesting first of all the actual graphics card does not always stay pegged to 100 percent usage although it stays pretty close but sometimes it varies in the 95 94 percent usage range I haven't seen it drop below 90% yet, although if it did, I missed it. Temperature is a very respectable 71 degrees Celsius, which for a high clock 1080 Ti is quite good. The fan is running at 55%, which works out to 1590 RPM. Note that we are on the auto fan speed profile. I have not manually overclocked this card. I've not adjusted the fan speed. It is running at stock settings. You can certainly add another 50 megahertz to this card if you want to. In MSI Afterburner, you simply type in a plus 50 offset to the clock speed of the card itself, and you would definitely get a little more performance, but it's not going to make a big difference. And very few of these cards will run much above 2000. You might get 2025 or even 2050 if you are lucky, but then the temperatures will go up, the fan speed will have to be run faster, and you'll be looking at adding maybe one frame a second, maybe two frames a second if you're lucky. The difference isn't that much because you haven't changed the performance of anything else. Your VRAM's the same, your system RAM's the same, your CPU's the same. So overclocking only one part of your computer doesn't necessarily produce the big change that you might expect unless that one part was the primary limitation. Look at the graphics card. We're at 85, 87% usage at the moment. It's not that overloaded. Look at the CPU usage. We're at 62, 46, the CPU 57%. Line three, that's all over the place. Essentially, Ghost Recon Wildlands will absolutely use all eight cores of this processor, but not all the time there are times where there isn't demand for it. And so frame rate limitations, what's preventing this from running faster, depends a lot upon where we're at in the game. There are times where the frame rate will not go up even when the graphics card's not busy because the game doesn't need eight cores and so it isn't running any faster. But the frame rate does not dip badly when it does need the eight cores because the Ryzen 7 CPU has enough to handle it. 
This is an example of how it's so hard to benchmark this and show the benefits of having eight cores versus four, because you can absolutely play this game on a four core CPU and the benchmark charts won't look that bad, but actually playing the game will not be as good of an experience. It doesn't show up in a chart though. And for those of you who go, man, just show some charts. This is overkill. Why are you showing this? This part of the game right here is exactly why. When we were back around the oil refinery, there were times when the CPU usage dropped down to 25 to 30 percent, and then you've seen it jump up to 60 plus percent. What you are seeing here is the fact that the per core performance does limit maximum frame rates, but the minimum frame rates and the smoothness of the game are helped out tremendously by having eight different real processing cores. So more cores don't necessarily give you a higher frame rate, but they give you a better frame rate. They give you a smoother overall experience. One question that many people may ask is, why didn't I put this graphics card in an i7-7700K overclocked to the max? Wouldn't it provide better average and better max frame rates? Yes, it would but it would provide a worse overall gaming experience. Source, me, I've done that. I've played Ghost Recon Wildlands on the i7 before. I've shown those videos on my channel. The hitches and the stuttering are real. Now, most of the time, it's great until it isn't, until it just kind of isn't, and then it performs well, and then it doesn't, and then the game pauses, and then it stutters, and then it's really fast. Those don't occur terribly often, but they really take you out of the game, or at least they take me out of the game when they do. I am less concerned with having 150 frames per second than I am with having 75 frames per second that is smooth and consistent. Your desires, your needs may vary. If 150 frames per second is your goal, yeah, the i7-7700K would be a better choice. Put a big cooler on it, overclock it to five gigahertz or close to it, and your maximum and your average frame rates will be better, but your minimums and your stuttering will be worse. So which one do you want? Now, Intel's upcoming i9 Skylake X CPUs will give you the choice of the best of both worlds. Those upcoming CPUs are going to have up to 18 cores. Now you don't need 18 cores for this, but they're going to offer an eight core 16 thread version for about $600 or about twice the cost of a Ryzen 7 1700. Is it worth the extra performance? That's up to you to decide. I will test it when it comes out, but you're looking at probably a 25%, maybe? We don't know yet, because we haven't tested it, maybe a 30% performance increase in terms of average and max frame rates, along with the smoother frame rates that we currently get on Ryzen, but you're gonna be spending double the money for the CPU, 600 versus 300. You will also be spending twice as much for the motherboard. The X299 motherboards are certainly going to be about double the price of the X370 motherboards we can install a Ryzen 7 1700 or 1700X into. So are you okay to spend 600 on the CPU and 250 to $300? Oops, and I died because I was being shot at. My guys are rescuing me though, it's no big deal. So are you willing to spend 600 on the CPU and let's just call it 250. You're looking at $850 for the eight core 16 thread Skylake X chip versus say 400 to $450 for Ryzen 7 1700 or 1700 X. That is a lot of extra money for an extra 20 to maybe 30 frames per second max and an extra 10 to 20 frames per second on the average. Now, if you're okay to spend it, then by all means do so. It's certainly going to be an option. Skylake X will be coming out later this summer and I will be reviewing it and I will compare it to Ryzen and we'll see how well it does in the real world. Now let's transition to 1440p at very high detail. Now the 1080p run was done at ultra because this card can handle it, but at 1440p, ultra is quite challenging. Would it run? Yes. Would it be smooth? Not really. Now for any of you who skipped ahead to this using the timestamps in the description below, the last minute of the 1080p run was a discussion of Ryzen 7 versus i7 7700K versus the upcoming i9s and my opinions and thoughts on how they're going to run upcoming games. So if you're interested in that discussion, rewind about two minutes and you can listen to it. 
Moving on from that, let's take a look at the real-time performance numbers at 1440p at very high detail. Ouch! That would break the suspension. Thankfully, it's a video game. So our graphics card is completely utilized up here, except of course in the map where we're frame rate locked. Uh, we're currently at 64% usage because you see our frame rate is down there, but there we go. Now the frame rate is back up, we're about 75 frames per second, and you can see the GPU is back up to about 97, 96% usage. This is one of those games, and there are many others, where when you pull the map up, the game auto locks to 60 frames per second. It's always something to keep in mind whenever you're doing live benchmark testing is how much of the time was spent looking at the map versus how much time was actually spent playing the game. If more than 1% of the time is on the map, then it will drag that 1% minimum down. That's one of the reasons why I play this for so long. An average of 20 to 30 minutes per run in order to get those averages out of the 1% minimum, although it will affect the 0.1% uh, minimum. VRAM usage is no big deal. In fact, frankly, I haven't really found a situation where 11 gigabytes of VRAM is remotely required, but it's good to have it because over the next three years of owning this card, it does give you some future proofing. It gives you the knowledge knowing that 2018 and 2019's games are not going to run into a VRAM limited situation. On some of the older cards where the top end card didn't have quite so much VRAM, that was a bigger concern. Say a 780 Ti, for example, with three gigabytes of VRAM, that three gigs of VRAM is starting to become a limitation, certainly in the higher detail settings. And there's another truck with a minigun. Boy, why do these rebels need American help if they're driving around with endless vehicles on the open road in broad daylight with miniguns? The Santa Blanca cartel and even the Unidad paramilitary forces can't be that bad if the uh, rebels just drive around in broad daylight armed with electric miniguns. But don't worry, four lowly American special forces in the huge country of Bolivia will completely turn the tide and do everything all by themselves, Why? whereas the thousands and thousands of rebel soldiers who have endless supplies of helicopters, trucks, miniguns, and all sorts of other equipment at their disposal can't possibly handle the situation themselves. Yes, this is realistic. Coming back to the performance numbers, you'll notice that we are comfortably over 60 frames per second, but not massively so. We're bouncing between around 65 and 75 frames per second. Now, if we ran this at ultra detail, would it be playable? Yes. Would it be over 60 frames a second? No. And the lows, the times where the frame rate really dips down, would make the game not unplayable, but less pleasant. My recommendation is if you're going to play Ghost Recon Wildlands at 1440p on a GTX 1080 Ti, then Very High will provide a better overall experience than Ultra, and frankly the graphical differences aren't that vast. In my opinion, Ultra Detail is great for screenshots. It's great for crushing new hardware and showing um, performance across a wide variety of hardware with performance graphs that look very disparaging. For example, when I did the recent 780 Ti versus 980 Ti versus 1080 Ti video, I did those comparisons at high detail because I wanted to show that in fact the game was playable. I'm not just trying to sell video cards here. I, unfortunately, some benchmarks and some tests really are just going, hey, quick, you need to buy a new video card. Um, my channel is called Tech Deals for a reason. I want to show you what you can get out of your hardware, so I look for playable settings. Can you play this on a three and a half year old 780 Ti? Yes, just you need high detail. And high detail looks very nice. There's nothing wrong with playing at high detail. If you want ultra, yeah, okay, granted you need to upgrade your card. And that's a personal choice that I leave for you, my viewers, to make rather than tell you, yes, sorry, you gotta buy a new video card every year because, you know, the video card companies need to sell video cards. Now, in the future, I'm going to do a GTX 780 versus 1080 versus 1080 Ti video. In that case, what I'm going to show you is how much detail you can expect on each card. So, for example, while we're doing very high on a 1080 Ti at 1440p, you likely will have to run at high detail at 1440p on, say, a GTX 1080. How about the 1070? I actually don't know. I haven't tried it yet. Will it run high detail? It probably will. It's not that much slower, but it definitely will have dips below 60 frames per second. And some of you running Ghost Recon Wildlands on a GTX 1070 at 1440p might find medium detail to be a better overall experience. Now, those of you who have 
high refresh rate monitors. And those are a thing, even at 1440p, you can buy a 1440p 144 hertz high refresh rate monitor. What's it gonna take to get those kind of frame rates? Well, high detail on a 1080 Ti would certainly help, but for high refresh rates, you also wanna look at your CPU. Now, currently the best available choice that we have in June of 2017 when I'm filming this is an i7-7700K. The problem with that chip is while it would definitely give you probably another 20 frames per second average and maximum than the Ryzen chip will, it will stutter a lot and the lows are worse. It's a worse overall gaming experience because while you have higher highs, you have lower lows and you have more in-game stuttering when the game wants to do more than four things in at once and the 7700K is only a four core processor. Now, when the new Skylake X chips, the i7 and i9 Skylake X chips come out, this situation will be largely resolved. If you want 25% more performance and you want eight cores, great, $600 to Intel for a Skylake X eight core 16 thread chip and about 200 to $250 for an X299 motherboard has got Got you covered. Now, if you're buying a 1440p 144 hertz screen and you're buying a $700 GTX 1080 Ti, I can actually understand and make an argument for buying a $600 CPU and a $200 or $250 motherboard. Yes, you'll have $800 to $850 into your CPU and motherboard combo, but if you're buying a $750 graphics card, if you're buying a $500 to $700 monitor, Fair enough, that's actually not unreasonable. I will test that when it comes out. It's worth considering that at that level of peak performance, the Skylake X might simply be a smart choice. For the rest of us, however, who are concerned about frame rates at or below 100, Ryzen is a much, much better deal in terms of dollars to frame rates performance. When I review Skylake X, I will definitely put up those charts, dollars per FPS. So the idea there is to show how much value for your money are you getting versus how much absolute performance. So I'll show it both ways. I'll put up a dollars per frame rate chart to show the extra money you're spending to get the performance, how much of a value that Ryzen is. And then of course I'll put up the absolute numbers to show you how much more total performance the faster platform of Skylake X is gonna provide. And the question is, are you willing to spend the perhaps $400 price premium for an eight core Skylake X versus an eight core Ryzen 1700X? That's a personal choice. I cannot tell you which one is best. I can simply show you the performance, show you the prices, show you how much you're paying per frame you're getting, and then you have to decide what makes the most sense for you. Now I'm going to cut this run a little bit shorter to keep the length of the video somewhat reasonable and we're gonna to transition to 4K, otherwise known as 2160p. Now we are at high detail. Could you play this at very high? Yes, but the performance is a little bit not great. It, it is playable at very high, but it's smoother at high detail. And I'm gonna show you that in the built-in benchmarks later. The difference in this game between high and very high is not massive, but the difference between very high and ultra is huge. It, it does look nicer when you're, wow, look at the, the mist. That is gorgeous. The mist, the, the fog coming across those trees, and this is not even at ultra or very high. This is at high detail, and it's absolutely beautiful. Now, we're going to land because we're going to get ourselves a vehicle because I'm going to go after a convoy. I do a lot of that when I do this benchmarking because it's fairly consistent. There's always a convoy running around somewhere. It doesn't require me to actually advance the storyline, and frankly, it's fun to take one of these. Hey, look, another minigun. Taking a look at the real-time performance, we are now using about four and a half gigabytes of VRAM at high detail at 4K, not even half of the VRAM on this card. CPU usage is respectable, just under 50% of our 16 thread eight core CPU, and then main system RAM is right at about eight gigabytes. Now we have 16 gigs installed, and I would seriously hope that anyone who is running a GTX 1080 Ti has at least 16 gigs installed. I could make an argument for this machine for 32. If you're gonna have a Ryzen 7 1700X, a GTX 1080 Ti, and all the other great hardware that you'd put in such a machine, 32 gigs might not be crazy. Now you don't really need it for gaming, but if you're multitasking, if you're live streaming, if you're editing videos, if you're doing anything else besides gaming, and you certainly wanna game maybe while having stuff on in the background, then 32 gigs might not very well be overkill. It's only about an extra $100, $110 to go from 16 to 32 gigs. And when you consider what a machine like this costs, 
that's not too bad actually. Something that I did not talk about at the beginning of this video is the memory speed. Um, this particular set of runs was done with the DDR4 3200 MHz RAM running at 2933. Now this is actually the first performance video that I can remember where I published it at 2933. I've tested it at DDR4 3200 and I've tested it at DDR4 2666. Why are we at 2933? The motherboard in this particular system at the moment is the ASRock Fatality Gaming K... Ow, man, that's just all sorts of bad. Is the ASRock Fatality Gaming K4 motherboard. Now, it does have the updated BIOS with the 1.0.0.6 um, GS, I think I'm pronouncing that right, BIOS version, which improved RAM compatibility. It is not, however, on the QVL or qualified vendor list for the Flare X RAM. And this board does not want to run DDR4-3200 with my 1700X at 4 gigahertz. This has nothing to do with this particular benchmark, but I'll toss it in just because I'm gonna let the benchmark play, I let the game play, and it gives me something to talk about. Now, if I clock my Ryzen 7 1700X in this board, the Flare X RAM runs perfectly at DDR4-3200 without complaint. But with the Ryzen 7 1700X at 4 gigahertz, it will not, it crashes. With the DDR4 RAM at 2933, I can run stable all day long at 4 gigahertz. But that's in this board. On my MSI X370 X Power Gaming Titanium board, 4 gigahertz DDR4 3200 works perfectly every time. Why don't I have that board in this system? Well, I do play around with each of the boards and I swapped it out because I actually was getting sent a retail board. The previous tests that I've done on the MSI board were with the press kit board. I did not get a retail kit with that. I was simply sent a bare board by AMD at the Ryzen 7 launch and I didn't want to keep using a pre-launch press board. The press boards actually are an earlier revision of the board than what is in the retail kits. I actually compared the two because MSI was kind enough. They recently sent me, and you've seen it already, it's been published to my channel, an unboxing and overview of the retail kit of that MSI X Power Gaming titanium motherboard. Expensive board, not for everybody. The Gaming Pro Carbon is over $100 less and frankly is probably a better choice for most people, but that titanium board sure is shiny. In any case, it runs at 32 uh, DDR4 3200 at 4 gigahertz without complaint. So your selection of motherboard matters, your selection of RAM matters. Overclocking is going to be different. What you get on your uh, overclocking of RAM and CPU is going to vary from board to board, chip to chip, and memory module to memory module. Lots of times I see comments beneath my videos from somebody saying, what's the best board to buy? How am I going to be guaranteed to get 4 gigahertz or guaranteed to get 3200? You aren't ever in any combination because it's all overclocked. That's the whole definition of overclocking. You are not going to be able to just go out and go to Newegg or go to Amazon and buy a specific board, specific RAM, and specific CPU and be guaranteed it will run at those speeds. Now, in fairness, if you buy the Flarex RAM, which is Ryzen certified to run at DDR4-3200, and in the MSI X-Power Titanium, in the ASUS Crosshair 6 Hero uh, ROG board, yes, the, it, it does run just fine in those because it's supported and tested. But the CPU overclocking's not. You might not on every Ryzen 7 CPU get a fixed 4 gigahertz. You might be running at 3.9 or 3.8. Wait a minute, you say? That's ridiculous. What does the CPU's clock speed have to do with the RAM and the motherboard? If I buy proper RAM and a, and a motherboard with the proper BIOS with support, the CPU shouldn't matter. Au contraire, it does. The Infinity Fabric, the link between the uh, CPU complex modules on the Ryzen 7 chip, runs at half the speed of your memory. So if you overclock the RAM, if you're running the RAM at 3200, then the Infinity Fabric is running at half that speed or 1600 megahertz. If you're running DDR4-2400, for example, then the Infinity Fabric, linking the two modules on the CPU, because it's basically two quad cores glued together, then it's running at 1200 megahertz. So you might very well have a Ryzen 7 CPU that will run at 4 gigahertz all day long so long as you are not trying to make the Infinity Fabric run at 1600 megahertz. Now in this case, I'm running at DDR4-2933. The Infinity Fabric on this chip, on this board, does not complain about running at that speed. But wait a minute. 
you just said that this chip runs fine in the MSI X Power Titanium at 4 GHz with DDR4 3200 at 3200. Sure, different motherboard, different BIOSes, different setup. Now the cooler was the same. I have an excellent EK water block, 240 millimeter thick cooler installed and it's what I've used for all of my Ryzen 7 1700X tests. Temperature is not an issue. This thing is running extremely cool. I am not remotely temperature limited no matter what motherboard I've used because that cooler is absolutely a beast. I actually hope to get a nice EK uh, water block to test on because mostly I've done Corsair all-in-one liquid coolers and they do fine, but this cooler is definitely cooling the CPU to a lower temperature than my Corsair coolers are. So I'd like to take a look at some other coolers besides just the Corsairs I've looked at in the past. A quick follow-up regarding RAM. Um, the MSI and the ASUS Crosshair board do not yet have the final release of their 1.0.0.6 Aegis BIOS, and so I've not done a follow-up RAM speed test with uh, not just the Flare X RAM, which does run fine as it stands, but also with the Trident Z, Rip Jaws RAM, the Gale RAM, and some of the others. Once those updated BIOSes come out, which actually should be just in the next couple of weeks, I will go back and stick each of my different RAM kits into those systems and see how well they run. Most of them will not run over DDR4-2666, but my gaming K4 ASRock board will because it has the updated BIOS. So it's worth noting that it's still an, an evolving and changing environment for RAM support with Ryzen. They are working on it, and I can tell you from having talked to both AMD as well as G-Skill, it's something that they have hundreds of RAM kits and boards that they're testing in various configurations with different CPUs at different timings. It's not just the kits, it's worth noting that various timings work differently. So for example, some have CL14, some have CL16, uh, but there's more to it than just the CAS and the RAS refresh. There's actually about 20, 25 different timing settings uh, most of which are starting to be exposed buried in advanced DRAM timing. However, one RAM kit might run at DDR4-3200 in stock speeds using the XMP profile on board A, but on board B, a couple of those timings might have to be adjusted just a little bit. One of the things they're working on with the BIOS updates is to detect which specific RAM kit that you've installed, because they each have an SPD or serial presence detect. So the board can actually detect the specific kit and part number that you've installed, not just uh, that it's just DDR4 RAM. And the idea is that the board's BIOSes will go, oh, you've installed this part. Yep, that is in our table of tested memory kits. So even though you've set it to XMP and you've just selected DDR4-3200, the board internally will go, well, I know I need to set these 25 different settings here and this RAM will work. And then if you put a different kit in, it'll make subtle changes to those. Is it gonna be a big deal when it comes to overall performance? No. Um, I've played around with some of them, not all of them. I've played around with some of them just enough to know mostly I don't want to play with most of them because you really, really have to know what you're doing with those. But what I will say is that while the RAM may very well work at DDR4-3200, that does not mean it's going to do it on every CPU, on every board, at every overclock because of Infinity Fabric. So what you may run into is if you overclock your RAM to 3200 and your CPU to 3.8, it runs great. And then you set it to four gigahertz and then it crashes. And you set it to 3.9 and then it works sometimes or it works, you know, at 2933. So overclocking can be as much of an art as well as a science. You gotta play around with it and find what works best for you. Regarding overclocking, a good overclocking video is something that I have been asked for several times in the comment section beneath various videos. I had planned on doing one on my Ryzen 7 1700 build. That has the ASUS Crosshair Hero 6 motherboard in it. The reason I have not done it yet, well, it's twofold. One, that machine very quickly became my daily driver production machine, and I don't do benchmark testing and tweaking on that. That's actually what I'm doing the voiceover on right now. I'm recording this voiceover on the Ryzen 7 1700, which please note is a completely different machine than the one that recorded the video. I've got two Ryzen 7s, the other one's in a different case, so the 1700X stays in there. My 1700 has a Cooler Master Master Liquid 240 on it, for example, not the EK water block. So these are, these are different machines. Now, I've got a Ryzen 7 1800X build video coming soon. That's gonna go on the MSI X360 X-Power Titanium. 
that's going to become my new production machine. That will allow me to take this that I have now, the Ryzen 7 1700, I'm going to take it back out and finish the rest of the videos on it. I never did a good RGB video on it. That's in the MasterMaker 5T. And uh, I, I have promised Cooler Master I would do that, and I will, because they sent me that case. And it's really, really, really nice. It's really pretty. The tempered glass panels look better than I thought it would. Um, but when it became my production machine, I kind of went, yeah, okay, fine. I'm going to start using it because I love Ryzen for my workload, for my experience. It very quickly replaced my i7-6800K Broadwell E. I wouldn't have thought, actually, prior to doing so that the addition of just two cores would make a difference. Going from six to eight cores, oh, it's, it can't, it's only 25%. It's not that big a deal, right? Oh, lordy, 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 it is. The, the difference in usability, the difference in multitasking. Note that when I talk about Ryzen and how much I love Ryzen, keep in mind, I didn't come from a four core i7. I came from a six core i7. And even that little change made a difference. Now, I've been asked, is the upcoming Threadrippers and i9s going to make a big difference for gaming? I don't think so. I don't think 16 cores is needed for gaming. I think for my kind of workload, it's going to be ideal. If you do production, if you do video editing, video rendering, uh, software development, if you do virtual machines, if you do that kind of work, I think upcoming Threadripper or if your preference is for Intel, the upcoming i9s are going to be a big leap forward in usability of the average desktop PC at a price point that we haven't seen before. Yes, there are already 16 core chips. Yes, those exist, but they cost more. They're on the server platform. They weren't mainstream. Now you're gonna be able to get a 16 core, 32 thread chip on the mainstream platform at a semi-reasonable price. Rumors are that the 16 core Threadripper chips from AMD are gonna be under $1,000. Please note that the 16 core 32 thread i9 chips are $1,700. Now, they will almost certainly be faster. I'm not gonna remotely claim that there's no performance difference between the Threadripper and the i9, given Intel's higher IPC, given the fact that they've, uh, the higher clock speeds they've already announced, I will be surprised if the $1,700 chip is not 20 to 25% faster than Threadripper, but it's double the price. Is it worth double the price? Well, that depends upon who you are. If you have software developers using it and they can actually make use of 16 cores and you're paying software developers $100,000 a year, yeah, actually, it's probably totally worth the money. Their time is valuable enough that even small chunks of time saved while they're working would pay for itself very, very quickly. If, on the other hand, you're just using the computer yourself, maybe you do YouTube, perhaps uh, you want to balance between value and absolute top max performance, then Threadripper is going to be an amazing value for the money. I'll test them when they come out. We'll see how that goes. I don't think it's going to make a difference for gaming, but I reserve the right to be pleasantly surprised. We shall see. Now that's enough of the live game performance testings. I am now going to show you the built-in benchmark. This is nine different tests. This is 1080p at high, very high, and ultra, and then 1440p, and then 2160p, otherwise known as 4K. Again, high, very high, and ultra. Now I'll have charts with all these details up in a minute, so you can certainly use the timestamps below to skip ahead if you don't wanna watch this. But I'm putting one of each of the runs in here so that you can see the real-time performance as it runs, you can see the frame rate, and you can see the detail level. Now, even if you are not watching this video on a 4K monitor, if you would like to see better quality, click the gear icon, assuming you're on a desktop computer, click the gear icon down below on the YouTube uh, control panel window and manually choose the 2160p resolution. Even if you're only watching on a 1080p, that causes YouTube to send you a higher bit rate, which improves the quality of the video. YouTube compresses 1080p video terribly, which is why this is all being upscaled, at least this part here, to 4K. Now the upscaling doesn't really add any detail. It's frankly way overhyped when it comes to, well, we'll upscale to 4K and it'll be better quality. No, it's just pixel doubling really. I mean, it smooths out a few lines, but it's pretty minor. The real reason to upload videos in 4K, and even my 1080p videos I upload in 4K, is because the way YouTube does file compression. Now here we are on the very high. These, these are pretty quick. We're on the very high run now. YouTube allocates five and a half times the bitrate for 4K video than it does to 1080p. 
Now, 4K video has four times the pixels of 1080p, but due to the efficiencies of file compression and having more detail to work with, the H.264 encoder can actually get a better image out of a relatively smaller bitrate because of the fact that adjacent pixels are more similar. It, it's As you increase resolution and as you increase frame rate, now the file size gets bigger, but the per bit efficiency in compression improves or to put it much more simply, you don't need four times the bit rate to get the same basic file quality when going from 1080p to 4K. And so actually 4K videos have a much higher bit rate and look much nicer on YouTube than 1080p videos do because of this. So if you want to see the difference between high, very high, and ultra here, then go down there and change it. To, now, you will need a better internet connection and a better processor to handle the video, but assuming that you do and assuming that it's smooth, that's one way that you can view higher quality videos even if you don't have a 4K monitor yourself. Now, in an ideal world, with all the time and all the resources without any constraints of actually getting videos out, I would have actually done live gameplay on all three detail settings on all three resolutions, but the amount of time that would have taken simply isn't justified, especially when you consider that high detail at 1080p on this card is to some extent overkill, and I tested it anyway in the GTX 780 Ti versus 980 Ti versus 1080 Ti. So if you want to see this game's live, if you want to see live performance on this card at 1080p at high detail, I've published that. It's just not in this video. But as far as, for example, 4K at Ultra, yeah, I mean, it'll run. I mean, I suppose you could play it, but no, not really. And frankly, it wouldn't be very much fun to benchmark because it's a pretty dreadful experience. Very high at 4K isn't too bad, but it's still, it has more dips and drops than I like to see. The improvement in graphical quality of very high over high is not with the performance loss, in my opinion. But that's a personal choice. You run whatever you want. Your computer, the beauty of a PC is you can choose your hardware, you can choose your resolution, you can choose your detail setting, which ultimately means you're choosing your frame rate. Here we are at very high at 1440p. As I said, these tend to run pretty quickly. If I just made a video of these nine runs, talked over it for a little bit and threw up charts, I don't think it'd be a very good video. I thought about it. I, I was debating because the amount of work I put into making this video, doing the three live game performance videos, the voiceover, creating the charts, and then doing the built-in benchmark, there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's not just, oh, I'll just spend an hour after work, sit down, record a couple of benchmarks, toss it up onto YouTube, and it's easy. This is a full-time job, and uh, frankly, I think a lot of people who haven't done this underestimate how long it takes. Now, I'm not trying to get you to play with the world's smallest violin or anything. However, that's why that wasn't done and why I would be tempted to make this separate videos in the future. But at the same time, I don't want to post endless videos that are kind of repeats of the same thing. The reason I ultimately decided to put these together, here we are at Ultra 1440p, is because the subject is exactly the same. Posting one video of live gameplay at three different resolutions and then posting another video of the same game at the same resolutions on the same card. I don't want to call it spammy, but it runs the risk of being like making videos for the sake of making videos. Now there's benefits in doing so because of views and watch time and YouTube ad revenue and those things help me as a professional content creator. But I balance that or I try to balance that against thinking what does my audience want? What is the best benefit for my audience? that doesn't abuse their time and the upload slots, and so I decided to put them together. Let me know in the comments below whether or not you think it's worth the extra time. Should I put in these built-in benchmarks? Should I stick to the live gameplay and just show you playable performance? Because keep in mind that the time it takes me to add these benchmarks is almost a whole other game I could have tested. And so it's a little bit of an experiment. I've never done this before with both live gameplay and built-in benchmarks to this extent. Now this video is gonna be almost an hour long, which is pretty much how long my 780 Ti versus 980 Ti versus 1080 Ti was. And that didn't have built-in benchmarks, but I was rambling more in that video talking about all sorts of topics. Sometimes I do that just to try to be entertaining or have some fun or you know kick back from the benchmarking a little bit. If every video was just 
Here's the number on the screen. Uh, let me read the number to you again. And oh, look, we have some more numbers. I think these would get incredibly boring, incredibly fast. So I try to find something fun to talk about, something interesting, talk about the CPUs, differences, and even some things that I've tried that maybe don't make it into the benchmark. Have I mentioned how much I appreciate the fact that you guys all watch my videos every day? I think that's epically cool. I am recording this voiceover on June 18th. And about an hour ago, I just passed over 143,000 subscribers. I don't know when you'll actually watch this or when I'll post it, but that's what I'm recording it. And I watched that tick over on Social Blade and I thought, wow, there's 143,000 people who have clicked that sub button and over 14 million views on my channel's lifetime, which is just over a year. I started my channel at the beginning of March 2016, and I'm really, really flattered that you guys come and hang out with me every day. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. It is very much appreciated. Have I commented recently how beautiful this game is? Sure, there are other games that have different levels of beauty, but I find it amazing how close the quality is getting to real life. There was a helicopter shot earlier in this video where there was some fog coming through the trees. Uh, we took off and we were flying forward in, the, in a, one of the little MD-500 helicopters and just the look of the fog and the way the light shone across it, dusk was setting, absolutely stunningly gorgeous. I have no doubt that in the next 10 or 20 years, we're basically going to have games that are indistinguishable from reality, or at least are so close that maybe they enter the uncanny valley where they're so realistic that anytime the, the realism fades, you get a jarring experience where you come out of the game a bit. Now, here we are in the last built-in benchmark, 2160p, 4K, ultra detail, GTX 1080 Ti, Ryzen 7 at 4 gigahertz. And yeah, look at this, it's 35 frames per second. You could play this, it's not really playable. And the overall performance during the dips during combat scenes, really, it drops below 30 frames per second. It's not a very good experience. Skip Ultra at 4K, at least until the next generation of cards comes out. Now here we are with the live gameplay results. The green bars are the averages. Let's talk about those first. 1080p ultra detail 71 frames per second very nice performance 1440p very high detail 80 frames per second great 4k 2160p high detail 58 frames a second notice the drop off here 4k is incredibly demanding and even more so in this game now let me talk about the red and the blue bars briefly. The red and blue bars are 1% and 0.1% minimum numbers. Now this is different than what I'll show you on the next three charts, but here the red bars is the 1% lows, meaning this is the lowest frame rate that it got to 99% of the time. There are frames below it. It's a typical minimum frame rate rather than an absolute minimum. The blue bars take it one decimal place further and take it to 99.9% .9 of the time and is much closer to a true minimum. So at 1080p ultra detail, we did drop below 60 frames a second. Not very often, but we did. But if you actually watch the gameplay, it's over 60 frames per second the vast, vast majority of the time. 1440p, solid. 59 frames a second, which might as well be 60, 99% of the time. And then 4K, we were down to 46 frames per second because our average is below 60. It was definitely the worst performing number all up. You could consider switching to high detail or maybe turning off anti-aliasing. You could adjust one or two settings in there and you would get over 60 frames per second average. It is worth noting at 4K, Anti-aliasing may not even be needed because the resolution is so high, the jaggies go away even with anti-aliasing turned off. But I test with presets, not with custom settings, mostly. So that's what it is at high. Make adjustments as you see fit. Now, please note this does not mean you need a 1080 Ti to play Ghost Recon Wildlands at 1080p resolution. Please note that a 3 gigabyte GTX 1060 will do it at high detail at 60 frames a second. This is ultra, and that just shows the difference between ultra and high detail. Now I'm going to show you three charts that shows you the built-in benchmark performance. This is 1080p at ultra, very high, and high detail. These are true minimums and maximums here because the built-in benchmark is not long enough to bother computing a 1% number, and the built-in benchmark provides its own numbers. These were not done with fraps. These are the built-in game performance numbers provided by the game's own built-in benchmark. Please note that I ran each test five times. 
twice first just to load everything into RAM and get everything cached to running properly and then three more times. I then average those three runs together at each detail setting and each resolution to come up with these charts. So as you can see here, ultra detail, 60 frames per second in the built-in benchmark, 96 frames per second at very high, and 106 frames per second average at high detail. You will notice throughout these charts that high and very high are not that far apart, whereas ultra is completely crushing. Next up, we've got the 1440p tests, which you will notice are not actually that far from 1080p. Please note that 1440p is actually much closer in resolution to 1080p. It's not actually in the middle. 1080p is 2 million pixels. 1440p is 3.6. 4K is 8.3 million. There is a much, much larger gap. There's only a 1.6 million pixel gap between 1080p and 1440p, whereas the gap between 1440p and 4K is 4.7 million pixels. In fact, there is a larger gap between 1440p and 4K than 1440p has pixels. So you are not doubling the pixels going from 1080p to 1440p, but you are more than doubling the pixels going from 1440p to 4 4K is crushing. It is very actually quite hard to do. So the 1080 Ti does 4K pretty well, but that's why there's such a big performance gap. So we're at 56, 82, and 93 frames per second, respectively between ultra, very high, and high detail at 1440p resolution. Um, ultra detail would be, as I said before, play a bowl, but it's actually going to dip below that 49 minimum frame rate you see here. The actual game is different than the benchmark, so I don't recommend ultra detail at 1440p. Now, what about 4K resolution? This chart should be pretty self-explanatory. 4K at ultra detail in the built-in benchmark averaged 37 frames per second. It had a minimum of 31. Let me tell you from actually trying into the game, which I did, but I'm not even going to bother showing it to you, it dips down into the mid-20s very quickly actually playing the game. It's not smooth. It's not an enjoyable experience. Even very high is not as good as this chart would indicate, which is why I don't like built-in benchmarks. This is sort of a difference engine. It shows you the difference between the cards in theory, but take a look at uh, 2160p here, 4K at high detail, 59 and 47, and it looks fine, and it is fine. But when you jump it up to very high, there's only a difference on the benchmark here of about six or seven frames per second. But the real world playability at very high versus high is greater than this. At least I find it to be so. When I try very high detail at 4K on this thing, it just, it's not there. I mean, it's fine if you're very tolerant to lags and if you're very tolerant to dips in frame rate, it's okay but high is a better overall experience. And that's why I'm including both the built-in benchmarks as well as the live gameplay, is because I really am showing you in terms of live gameplay where I think this game shines and in the benchmarks, well, they are what they are, but they're not gameplay. And I don't think they really represent the game as well as they could, or perhaps maybe they can't, but I'm not a fan of them. I like the live gameplay, but needless to say, 4K at ultra detail is simply not going to happen. I hope this video was helpful and useful to you. Click that like button, share this video with your friends. Remember to subscribe to my channel. Check the video description for links to everything in this video. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. Links down in the description below if you are able to. If not, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting is also appreciated. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.